Yes, okay. Um, we already were familiar with Madagascar thanks to the previous talks, but now I want to take you a little bit further east to the island of Mauritius, uh, all the way on the more than 500 kilometers east of Madagascar. And Mauritius emerged as dry land about 8 million years ago, and life was all very peachy until in 1598 the Dutch arrived, which is never a good sign. Um, and within a century after the arrival of the Dutch, the Dono was extinct. Um, and many people assumed that, because we only had accounts of uh, ships and some stories from people who traveled back to Europe, many people assumed that the Dodo was not real, it was a fairy tale animal, and we didn't really have enough evidence to assume it really had existed. Um, however, in 1864, George Clark, who was a natural history school teacher at Mauritius, uh, discovered people pulling out bones out of a swampy area in the southern part, or eastern part of Mauritius, in an area called Marosons, it's located over here. And um, he went to take a closer look, and he noticed that these bones represented a very big animal, and he sent them off to Richard Owen in, in London, and um, Owen told him that these were actually the remains of dodos, and then Owen ran with it and uh, published a monograph on it. And that's when actually people started to realize these were actually real animals and worth studying. However, over the years after that, Marosone slipped back into obscurity and more or less became forgotten. And at one point around the 1940s, malaria was prevalent in Mauritius, and the government had decided to eradicate malaria and dumped a lot of gravel blocks on the area that contained marosones. And people assumed that that was the end of marosones. And even later on, it was assumed that it had been built over by the new airport. So people had assumed that marosones was lost and nobody was really thinking about it anymore. However, in 2005, my colleague Kenneth Reinstein was working on an archaeological discovery very close to the area of marosones, more or less adjacent to it right here, and he was looking for areas to put cores, to, for coring, so he could get pollen samples and produce pollen diagrams to say something about the climate. And he managed to set a core right into the middle of the mouse orange. And when he pulled out bones, he was very surprised, and it turned out that he had rediscovered the mouse orange area. So everybody was really happy with that. Um, so this is an overview of the mouse orange area. Uh, it consists of three main basins, and all three basins um, one and two is a very small one, and three is over here. All of them are connected to the ocean, and they're very close to it. And you can even tell the difference in tides in the ground on the land of Marosons. That's how closely connected they are. Um, so what happened at Marosons? We know that many, many animals died there. Many, many dodos, many tortoises, many other small birds, many bats, and so on. Um, based on datings of wood, and bone samples. We know that Marosons was deposited in a very short window of time, more or less 130 years, which is very short. Um, and that area, that time period, coincides, the area is around 4,200 years ago, and that area, the time period coincides with a major drought period all over the world. It was not only noticeable on Mauritius, but it was also noticed on the African continent. So this was a very strong dry period. And during that area, Marosons was one of the very few sources of fresh water. So therefore, many animals gathered in that area for in search of drinking water. Um, this is a representation of Marosons area made, made by my colleague Julian Hume, and gives a good overview of what we think Marosons looked like at a time of this dry period. And you see many animals in search of water. You see giant tortoises. There's dodos. There's red rails. There's green echo parakeets, there's the gray parakeets, there's rails, um, there's even dead animals, and there's flamingos. Looks like a very nice idyllic area, but most of these animals that came here never really left the area and died here on the spot. <clears throat> so we knew that after the rediscovery of Marosons that we had to re-excavate, because it would provide a unique opportunity to study this area and to really have a window into the ecosystem of the dodo before the arrival of humans. Um, so shortly after the rediscovery, excavations were underway and we already had to gather some data. Uh, based on the first few years after 2005, up until 2009, um, 
we get a lot of evidence and based on historic collecting in the Mao zone by Arthur Clarke and others, um, we came up with a scenario that what we, of what we thought had happened in Mao zones. And this is mostly based on the dominance of hind limbs. Um, strangely enough, the majority of dodo bones that you find are hind limbs. Many, we don't find many cranial elements, we don't find many main elements. We find mostly femora, tibia, and um, pedal phalanges. So based on that dominance, we proposed a scenario in which animals became stuck in the mud. Animals that were already weakened by thirst would get stuck in the surface, in the sediments, and were unable to pull themselves out and get to safety. And therefore, what happens is an animal gets stuck, sinks into the sediment, it collapses and dies. When the water level rises, which can rise daily, weekly, and even monthly, um, much of the remaining animal is washed away, and that part of the skeleton is then lost. And what we are left with are the lower highlands. And that is what we're seeing in Mausaj. However, uh, based on pollen data, the Boer et al. last year proposed a different scenario. They said, we're seeing, in our pollen records, we're seeing evidence for toxic blooms. They're algae, we're producing toxic toxins that leach into drinking water, into fresh water, and animals that would have drank that water would have died. Um, but this is a very plausible scenario as well. So, what, what are we supposed to do with the, the dominance in the highlands? Because these two scenarios actually would result in different taphonomic signatures. And therefore, what, 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 what really happened? And can we tell the difference between different scenarios by looking at the taphonomy that we have? So it became obvious that we needed to excavate more systematically in Marazons that proposed all kinds of different challenges. Um, we decided that what we needed was a, kind of, was a dry surface area because uh, otherwise we would not be able to excavate systematically. However, um, when we brought in the heavy machinery, it turned out that creating a dry surface in Marazons is a bit of a challenge uh, because as soon as you take away the upper layer, which is where the large dolerite blocks were dumped in an effort to eradicate malaria, you quickly encounter the ground level water. Um, and to a degree that it was actually impossible to actually create a dry surface. So, um, this is, um, the reason why that is, is that Marmos Orange, as I said before, is connected uh, to the ocean as well as to uh, the water runoff that comes from the mountain areas nearby. And uh, at the bottom of Marmos Orange is a big layer of coral sands. It actually acts as a buffer for acidic groundwater. Uh, and it actually really contributes to the preservation of bones in this area. Uh, and up on top of that is a layer of chicha, which is an organic layer that has the consistency of tea leaves, as we say it. It's very loose, um, but it's very organic, it's finely pressed. Uh, on top of that is the bone layer that we're interested in, and on top of that is the big gravel layer that was dug there by humans. And our idea was to make um, a dammed area where we could actually pump dry water and then reach the bone bed level. Uh, in Dutch, we would call it a dodo polder, because being Dutch, that's what we do. We make polders everywhere. Um, so that's what we did. So here's our dodo polder in full glory. Uh, we're able to pump this dry. This is an area about uh, two by two and a half meters. And uh, we were able to pump dry this area and create a more or less dry surface. Um, more or less. So then we started to excavate systematically and we also mapped all bones and all remains in 3D, including the orientation and tilt. Uh, and for the methodology on this project, we would like to refer to our poster, which is currently on display next door. So if you're interested in how exactly this was done and how we use these data to support our story, then we would like to refer you to the poster. Um, and as you can see here, the bone layer is a mix of bones. Here you see a, a, a pelvic dodo pelvis almost next to a carapace of a giant tortoise. So this is a very closely mixed uh, matrix that not only includes bones but also many seeds and pieces of wood. So this is a very much is lacking. It's mostly bones, seeds, and other uh, microfloral elements. There's very little mud, very little sand in it. So during these three years, we systematically mapped and um, uh, uh, mapped all the bones and elements that we found. 
And in total, we found 492 fossil bones, the majority of which are giant tortoises. So that's something that's consistent with previous findings. Um, the second number is group is bats, two species of bats. Um, and then we find numerous fishes and birds who are still awaiting identification. And dodos, as enigmatic as they are, they are the, the, the species that is the least common. We only find 27 elements, uh, representative of two individuals, um, which again is very typical for the rest, for what seems to be the rest of Marathon. So this is not something that's in contrast to, to earlier collecting events. Um, However, if we're looking at the level of completeness of what we're finding, how much of a skeleton of an animal do we find, it's again very low. Um, but for the dodo, it seems to be the highest, but even this is an, is an overestimation of the amount of skeletal material that we're finding. So we 11% of the skeleton that we're finding, and for giant tortoises and for bats, it's even less so. So we're finding only very few elements of the animals that have died there despite the enormous amount of material that we found. Um, so if we're looking at the orientation of all the material, it's rather chaos. There's no real orientation, there's no preferred orientation, there's no significant orientation of all the material. Um, this is a representation of the dodo bones, tortoise bones, bat, fishes, and wood remains that we plotted in 3D. And as you can tell, there's no preferred orientation. Everything is mixed and um, that there's no preferred, no general orientation. Uh, a bit more about the orientation here is a uh, stereo plot of bone orientation. This is a 3D visualization, and the way to look at it is imagine you're looking at the top of a tree, and every data point on this, in this circle represents one uh, element that has a 3D orientation, and you're looking at it from above, from the y axis. Um, and if we look, again, this is very, there seems to be no preferred orientation in any of the remains that we found. Um, and if we look at the dip distribution, uh, now the dip is representative of the position of the, the bone inside the sediments, and um, we, as we're looking for evidence for a myring scenario, we were expecting the bones to be more or less in an upright position. Um, this seems to be not the case. The mean dip is around, is lower than 30 degrees, which is far removed from anything vertical, uh, which would be here. This is what we expected in the case of a Mayan scenario. Um, but again, there's no real pattern. There's no, the general dip is quite low, and it doesn't seem to be any indicator of um, the Mayan scenario that we thought we were expecting. So, in, in, in summary, all the bones are more or less randomly distributed. And the general, the mean dip is uh, quite low, it's around 22 degrees. Um, there's very little articulation and elements are not closely associated with each other. We mostly find loose skeletal elements. Uh, and the incompleteness of most of the skeletons exceeds 90%. So we only find single, or at least two pieces, at most two pieces of one skeleton. So how do we explain this with the previous scenarios that we have, that we proposed? Um, well, if we look at skeletal representation, and we look at it at a scale of 0 to 100%, we can have various options. We can have all bones chaotically oriented, or we can have them all neatly upright. And we can do the same for lower body presentation, articulation, association, and completeness. And we, can rate, we can rank where, more or less, we are in Mamas Honge. We can do the same for viscosity. Now, viscosity is a measure of stickiness, and the stick stickiness of your sediments. And as we were interested in how we could explain a possible miring scenario, we were interested in the stickiness of our sediments as well. Um, so tar is a very sticky substance. Think of the La Brea tar pits, which are very, very sticky. Now, if you would stick your hand in it, it would be very hard to get it clean. Uh, on the opposite side is water. Water is not very sticky. It's very clean. You can easily pull your hand out again. Um, so here we have a low viscosity environment, and here would be a high viscosity environment. And that has an effect on the bone representation in your cell. So if we were having a high viscosity scenario, we would find most bones upright. We would find most elements articulated and even associated. And we would find mostly complete or 
elements that would be, would be more complete than the ones that we're finding right now. And we probably also find the rest of the body, not just the lower part. So what we're dealing with in Marosonis is not a high viscosity or a very sticky sediment. What we're dealing with is, it seems to be the opposite. It seems to be in a very low viscous, viscous medium that is not as sticky, but is more, in a way, preventing animals from coming out since they don't have anything to stand on. Uh, as I showed before, Marosonis doesn't have any hard substances underneath. It's all very soft. The chicha layer is very soft. The coral sand is very soft. There's nothing for the animals. There's no support for the animals to get out. So once animals get into the sediment, get into the fresh water, um, the reason they can't get out is not because they're stuck in the mud, but because they can't physically find support to get themselves out of the system. Um, so in conclusion, the random orientations of limb bones, the low dip and postmodern muscle bone limb material indicate that high viscosity miring is very unlikely. And instead, um, all the evidence that we've gathered so far seems to be pointing towards a low viscous mud scenario where animals begin trapped in the mud and lacking foothold and maybe already weakened by poisoned water, they were unable to get themselves out and were eventually drowned or were actually trampled by other animals since it was a, appeared to have been a very, very busy place for animals that were in search of water. So instead of a high viscosity scenario, we're now thinking it's better explained by a low viscosity medium. So thank you. Um, you have many institutions to acknowledge, and I'll happily take any questions. Thank you.